32 years ago this summer, I was preparing to enroll in college at UWEC, the Eau Claire Blue Golds. Hey, we got some blue golds here. A beautiful campus, but a really odd, mythical-like bird mascot. I was not drawn in the least by the mascot. I was drawn by the promise, excellence, our motto, our measure, our goal. Well, just a month ago, Trin and I took our youngest, Mariana, on some college visits. And unlike her older brothers, who had no interest in exploring their parents' alma mater, Mari showed some inclination toward the nursing program at UWEC. And so we ventured to our old stomping grounds nestled along the banks of the Chippewa River, just down the road and river from world famous Lining Kugel's Brewery. <laughs> and would you know, as of late, I'm a little embarrassed to tell you, UW Eau Claire has decided to keep that goofy bird mascot. <laughs> After all kinds of voting, they voted to keep it. And to name it, of all things, Blue, B-L-U. Go figure. But I'm happy to tell you they have adopted a brand new, catchy, and clever motto. The power of and. The power of and. A wonderful counterbalance to the teaching of excellence and the formation of scholarly discipline. The power of and invites students to broaden their horizons, to become multi dimensional by engaging in the musics or the arts or sports or clubs or service opportunities to follow their passions and chase their dreams and become what we really want, well-rounded. What a welcome throwback to the old concept of a liberal arts education. Well, on our campus tour, we playfully asked students everywhere we went, so what's your and? And they all had an answer. So I wonder aloud to you this morning, as you go back to your home today and begin again your daily grind, that's that which you do day in and day out, what is your and? What makes your heart sing? What gifts are you employing? What dreams are you chasing that give you passion? I play a little piano when nobody is listening. Here's my premise for this morning. The story of God's presence and power throughout history is a story of and, the many. It's a story of expanding grace and abounding love. It's about widening invitations, not narrowing them. It's about planting possibilities not eliminating them. It's about opening doors, not closing them. I love being a part of a faith tradition that dares to care more about giving permission than setting parameter. Who's in and who's out is not even a relevant question anymore in my book. That is an either-or proposition that separates, that too often is used by those of us within to make ourselves feel worthy and proud, and too often is used by us within to those on the outside or beyond to make them feel guilty or shamed or in fear of what could happen. If we are to be truly welcoming as church, we must begin with the presupposition that all belong, 
period. We live in a both and world and we're called to be a both and church. Both card carrying UCC members and occasional affiliate connecting people, thanks be to God. So much has been written about millennials as of late, and I know that it's dangerous to talk about millennials when there are spectacular millennials in the room, so I'm going to do so carefully. But much has suggested they aren't joiners of organizations and certainly not lovers of institutions. It may be true that this generation will be indifferent to an irrelevant church. But we can see here today and all around they will engage in purposeful, meaningful mission and ministry. I wonder even, in fact, if millennials are helping the church relinquish our either-or mindset. You on our roles or are you not? In favor of both and valuing of people who intersect with church in a myriad of ways beyond Sunday morning. It's crazy. We live in an interconnecting and ever-blending world, and yet what do we do maybe to secure ourselves? We gravitate to our corners. We, we yearn for our separateness, our politics, dominated by either or. you red or blue. How desperately we are in need of the color purple once again both and ideas that can, that can be in the middle, where we can struggle and have tension, but we can talk. Our foreign policy is friend or foe. It's just defined. You're either with us or you're against us. But in a complex world, such oversimplification means we sometimes idolize without putting a moral compass to it. And we sometimes demonize prematurely because we don't fully understand. Even our stances on justice, though courageously prophetic, can be so off-putting and non-starting to those who aren't quite there yet so that we lose valuable opportunities to bring people along in the best sense of that phrase. A both-and approach allows us to say, in the words of Luther, here I stand, fully advocating for LGBTQ community. Here I stand, emphatic about the Palestinian right for a homeland. Here I stand, unwavering about the Paris Accord and no level of reckless abandon on one person's part will stop progress. Here I stand committed to the welcoming of immigrants and to black lives because they matter. Yet we can have these conversations in ways that transcend our angry polarities. We can honor people because all people are God's people. And we can know that while we disagree with their perspectives, there might be common ground in which we could plant seeds that just might take root. In many ways, God is calling us to be the church of both and to embrace new dimensions and fresh expressions of Christ-inspired community, while at the same time preserving our essential truths and the beloved practices that we cherish. Did you notice the church out of the box? Isn't that great? <laughs> Did you notice the church? It's not up here. It's still connected to the box. We can be the church of both and, a little out of the box and yet anchored. Why would we default to be the church of either or 
when we live in a both-and world. Years ago, I was confronted with that awful conundrum that ministers see coming about 14 miles away and run for the woods. Contemporary band or traditional organ? And I said two things. I'm not splitting services. We have two services, beloved people in both, and people love both in both. We're not going down that road. Second, what about a grand piano? Anybody think of that? And they all rolled their eyes, and a year later, we had purchased a grand piano, and we had a clavino that could play, clavinova that could play beautiful organ music, and we had a contemporary band singing, and we blended it all together. And as crazy as that may sound, it was an expression of the church as both and. And so we learned to appreciate pews. You know, there's a time for us to sit next to people we don't know with no barriers in between us in pews. And we appreciate chairs because they're mobile and we can make space for the communion table the next morning. And so we learn to appreciate high church with all of its liturgy and weird church with all of its craziness. We learn to appreciate robes and stoles and jeans and Birkenstocks. We learn to appreciate tall steeples and storefront worship centers, or organic gardening gatherings and dinner sacred conversations. We learn to appreciate protest rallies and socially conscious investing. It's all church. Two years ago, when we began to talk about the shift movement and this concept in which we invited congregations to let go of the long lament about our decline, and we wondered about a counterintuitive notion, instead of living out of fear, would we be so bold of a people to live by faith? What if we cultivated mission passions and chase them with the same tenacity that we tend to our budgets and we take care of our buildings. We discovered two things. Many, many congregations around the conference have come alive to the first. Such mission passion around some ministry, oftentimes when it streams out into the community and there are partners with you, is enormously energizing and exciting and is a catalyst for renewal. And second, that maintenance is still important. Because so long as we have buildings and budgets, that has to be on our radar screen. And so we are a both and church. The Apostle Paul, for all of the criticism that he could get from a vantage point this many years later. The Apostle Paul lived in a dualistic world, heaven and hell, sinner and saint, spirit and flesh. Yet he was an incredible proponent for the church of both and. Shaped by deep sensitivity to his Jewish roots, he was also influenced by a wider Hellenistic world and gained appreciation for the Greco-Roman people. Indeed, he advanced the doctrine of justification by faith, but he also saw good deeds as the rightful expression of that faith. It's the classic theological question, and I love the song, by grace, you know? We are here because of grace alone. He was a traveling evangelist, teaching how to grow and build the church, but he was also a strategist, a congregational coach, telling them how to get along. He may have been the first churchocrat without any authority, many have come afterward, which means he gave us the earliest expressions of both covenant community and autonomy in community. 
And we in the United Church of Christ are at our best when they are in healthy both and tension. Paul's interest is our interest. The uniting of the church. He gave wide permission for Jewish Christians to maintain their rituals unless they provided stumbling blocks. And for Gentile Christians to be fully welcomed into Christendom without subscribing to the prerequisite traditions. I dare say we could use a little lean in both and Pauline theology for the era of collaboration is upon us. I thank my God, said Paul, this many years ago. I thank my God with joy because of your partnership in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We no longer live in a world of simple categorization in which people are either confessed believers or avowed atheists. Frankly, the majority of our society lives somewhere away from the extremes in the middle. Even as we are living into a post-gender era, don't assume you know all about my identity. We are also living in a post-religious labeling era. Please don't put me in a box, but work with me where I'm at. And the beauty of this growing spiritual amalgamation is that diversity is all the more welcome. Conversation is all the more rich. And collaboration in pursuit of a kinder, more generous, and equitable world is all the more possible. It's taken the church a long time to come to grips with the reality that God blesses where God blesses. Wisdom blows where she blows. And that we on the inside neither own truth nor bask in privilege. For both the spiritually but not very religious and the devoutly practicing share the sacred. Gone are the days when we should compete. We should connect. So if we are going to continue asking the question, friends, when will all of those heathens out there come back to the church? We darn well better be asking the question, when will this one, oftentimes too sanctimonious and overly sure, when will I take to the streets to partner at the intersection of church and culture? That's where authentic community can be built. That's where real lives are changed. That's where love is tangibly demonstrated. And that's where there is no longer the assumption that the Great Commission is about acquiring people and gaining pledges. It's about embodying Christ and demonstrating the gospel of compassion to the world. So let's end where we began, with the power of and. And think about the intersection of church and culture, the cross, that vertical beam that could very well symbolize for us praying at the feet of Jesus and lifting our steeples to the heavens and all of the institutional beauty that we have known and loved, which we dearly want to preserve in whatever fashions. And yet that intersection at the heart of Jesus moving out to the hands and the calling for us to be the church of the cross beam in the coming years. And to stretch the hands of Jesus to reach hands that are not even of Jesus. But will share mission. 
and deeply desire to make this world a better place, I wonder for you and your congregation, along the cross beam of the intersection of church and culture, what could your and be? How could you help do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly for the sake of this world? In a moment, we are going to take an offering. That offering will go to help sustain two of our justice ministries. Lutheran Social Services, which participates in many of the refugee resettlements throughout the state of Wisconsin. And the resources we will need to share about conversations on race, which will take place, by the way, at many different access levels, understanding that some of the language won't, won't resonate everywhere. And so as we begin to think about giving ourselves and going to our homes, I ask God to bless you, to bless the gifts in your heart, to bless the experience that we've had together, to bless the gifts that you will bring forth, that they may, that they may share in the justice of the realm of God that we yet seek. Alleluia and amen.